Eros and Civilization, A Philosophical Inquiry into Freud, by Herbert Marcuse. Chapter 10, The Transformation of Sexuality into Eros. The vision of a non-repressive culture which we have lifted from a marginal trend in mythology and philosophy aims at a, few, at a new relation between instincts and reason. The civilized morality is reversed by harmonizing instinctual freedom and order. Liberated from the tyranny of repressive reason, the instincts tend toward free and lasting existential relations. They generate a new reality principle. In Schiller's idea of an aesthetic state, the vision of a non-repressive culture is concretized at the level of mature civilization. At this level, the organization of the instincts becomes a social problem. In Schiller's terminology, political as it does in Freud's psychology. The processes that create the ego and superego also shape and perpetuate specific societal institutions and relations. Such psychoanalytical concepts as sublimation, identification, and interjection have not only a psychical but also a social content. They terminate in a system of institutions, laws, agencies, things, and customs that confront the individual as objective entities. Within this antagonistic system, the mental conflict between ego and superego, between ego and id, is at one and the same time a conflict between the individual and his society. The latter embodies the rationality of the whole, and the individual's struggle against the repressive forces is a struggle against objective, re objective reason. Therefore, the emergence of a non-repressive reality principle involving instinctual liberation would regress behind the attained level of civilized rationality. This regression would be psychical as well as social. It would reactivate early stages of the libido, which were surpassed in the development of the reality ego, and it would dissolve the institutions of society in which the reality ego exists. In terms of these institutions, instinctual liberation is re relapse into barbarism. However, occurring at the height of civilization, as a consequence not of defeat, but a victory in the struggle for existence, and supported by a free society, such liberation might have very different results. It would still be a reversal of the process of civilization, a subversion of culture. But after culture had done its work and created the mankind and the world that could be free, it would still be regression. But in the light of mature consciousness and guided by a new rationality. Under these conditions, the possibility of a non-repressive civilization is predicated not upon the arrest, but upon the liberation of progress. So that man would order his life in accordance with his fully developed knowledge. So that he would ask again, what is good and what is evil? If the guilt accumulated in the civilized domination of man by man can ever be redeemed by freedom, then the original sin must be committed again. We must again eat from the trees of knowledge in order to fall back into the state of innocence. The notion of a non-repressive instinctual order must first be tested on the most disorderly of all instincts, namely sexuality. Non-repressive order is possible only if the sex instincts can, by virtue of their own dynamic and under changed ex existential and societal conditions, generate lasting erotic relations among mature individuals. We have to ask whether the sex instincts, after the elimination of all surplus repression, can develop a libidinal rationality, which is not only compatible with, but even promotes pro progress toward higher forms of civilized freedom. This possibility will be examined here in Freud's own terms. We have reiterated Freud's conclusion that any genuine decrease in the societal controls over the sex instincts would even under optimum conditions reverse the organization of sexuality toward pre-civilized stages. Such regression would break through the central fortifications of the performance principle. It would undo the channeling of sexuality into monogamic reproduction and the taboo on perversions. 
Under the rule of the performance principle, the libidinal cathexis of the individual body and libidinal relations with others are normally confined to leisure time and directed to the preparation and execution of genital intercourse. Only in exceptional cases and with a high degree of sublimation are libidinal relations allowed to enter into the sphere of work. These constraints enforced by the need for sustaining a large quantum of energy and time for non-gratifying labor perpetuate the desexualization of the body in order to make the organism into a subject object of socially useful performances. Conversely, if the workday and energy are reduced to a minimum without a corresponding manipulation of the free time, the ground for these constraints would be undermined. Libido would be released and would overflow the institutionalized limits within which it is kept by the reality principle. Freud repeatedly emphasized that the lasting inter interpersonal relations on which civilization depends, depends presuppose that the sex instinct is inhibited in its aim. Love and the enduring and responsible relations which it demands are founded on a union of sexuality with affection, and this union is the historical result of a long and cruel process of domestication, in which the instincts legitimate manifestation, or the instincts legitimate manifestation, is made supreme and its component parts are arrested in their development. This cultural refinement of sexuality its sublimation to love took place within a civilization which established possessive private relations apart from and in a decisive aspect conflicting with the possessive societal relations. While outside the privacy of the family, men's existence was chiefly determined by the exchange value of their products and performances, their life in home and bed was to be, was to be permeated with the spirit of divine and moral law. Mankind was supposed to be an end in itself, and never a mere means, but this ideology was effective in the private rather than in the societal functions of the individuals, in the sphere of libidinal satisfaction rather than in that of labor. The full force of civilized morality was mobilized against the use of the body as mere object, means, instrument of pleasure. Such reification was tabooed and remained the ill-reputed privilege of whores, degenerates, and perverts. Precisely in his gratification, and especially in his sexual gratification, man was to be a higher being, committed to higher values. Sexuality was to be dignified by love. With the emergence of a non-repressive reality principle, with the abolition of the surplus repression necessitated by the performance principle, this process would be reversed. In the societal relations, reification would be reduced as the division of labor became reoriented on the gratification of freely developing individual needs, whereas in the libidinal relations, the taboo on the reification of the body would be lessened. No longer used as a full-time instrument of labor, the body would be re-sexualized. The regression involved in this spread of the libido would first manifest itself in a reacti reactivation of all erotogenic zones and consequently in a resurgence of pregenital polymorphous sexuality and in, a and in a decline of genital supremacy. The body in its the body in its entirety would become an object of cathexis, a thing to be enjoyed, an instrument of pleasure. This change in the value and scope of libidinal relations would lead to a disintegration of the institutions in which the private interpersonal relations have been organized, particularly the monogamic and patriarchal family. These prospects seem to confirm the expectation that instinctual liberation can lead only to a society of sex maniacs, that is, to no society. However, the process just outlined involves not simply a release, but a transformation of the libido from sexuality constrained under genital supremacy to erotization of the entire personality. It is, it is a spread rather than explosion of libido, a spread over private and societal relations. 
which brings the gap maintained between them by your oppressive reality principle. This transformation of the libido would be the result of a societal transformation that released the free play of individual needs and faculties. By virtue of these conditions, the free development of transformed libido beyond the institutions of the performance principle differs essentially from the release of a constrained sexuality within the, do the dominion of these institutions. The latter process explodes suppressed sexuality. The libido continues to bear the mark of suppression and manifests itself in the hideous form so well known in the history of civilization, in the sadistic and masochistic orgies of desperate masses, of society elites, of starved bands of mercenaries, of prison and concentration camp guards. Such release of sexuality provides a periodical, a periodically necessary outlet for unbearable frustration it strengthens rather than weakens the roots of instinctual constraint. Consequently, it has been used time and again as a prop for suppressive regimes. In contrast, the free development of transformed libido within transformed institutions while eroticizing previously tabooed zones, time, and relations would minimize the manifestations of mere sexuality by integrating them into a far larger order including the order of work. In this context, sexuality tends to its own sublimation. The libido would not simply reactivate pre-civilized and infantile stages, but would also transform the perverted content of these stages. The term perversions covers sexual phenomena of essentially different origin. The same taboo is placed on instinctual manifestations incompatible with civilization and on those incompatible with repressive civilization, especially with monogamic genital supremacy. However, within the historical dynamic of the instinct, for example, coprophilia and homosexuality have a very different place and function. A similar different pr difference prevails within one and the same perversion. The function of sadism is not the same in a free libidinal relation and in the activities of SS troops. The inhuman, compulsive, coercive, and destructive forms of these perversions seem to be linked with the general perversion of the human existence in a repressive culture. But the perversions have an instinctual substance distinct from these forms, and this substance may well express itself in other forms compatible with normality in high civilization. Not all component parts and stages of the instinct that have been suppressed have suffered this fate because they prevented the evolution of man, man and mankind. The purity, regularity, cleanliness, and reproduction required by the performance principle are not naturally those of any mature civilization, and the reactivation of prehistoric and childhood wishes and attitudes is not necessarily regression. It may well be the opposite, proximity to a happiness that has always been the repressed promise of a better future. In one of his most advanced formulations, Freud once defined happiness as the subsequent fulfillment of a prehistoric wish. That is why wealth brings so little happiness. Money was not a wish in childhood. But if human happiness depends on the fulfillment of childhood wishes, civilization, according to Freud, depends on the suppression of the strongest of all childhood wishes, the Oedipus wish. Does the realization of happiness in a free, civiliza free civilization still necessitate this suppression, or would the transformation of the libido also engulf the Oedipus situation? In the context of our hypothesis, such speculations are insignificant. The Oedipus complex, although the primary source and model of neurotic conflicts, is certainly not the central cause of the, dis of the discontents in civilization, and not the central obstacle for the removal. The Oedipus complex passes even under the rule of a repressive reality principle. Freud advances two general interpretations of the passing of the Oedipus complex. It becomes extinguished by its lack of success, or it must come to an end because the time has come for its dissolution, just as the milk teeth fall out when the permanent ones begin to press forward. 
the passing of the complex appears as a natural event in both cases. We have spoken of the self-sublimation of sexuality. The term implies that sexuality can, under specific conditions, create highly civilized human relations without being subjected to the repressive organization which the established civilization has imposed upon the instinct. Such self-sublimation presupposes historical progress beyond the institutions of the performance principle, which in turn would release instinctual regression. For the development of the instinct, this means regression from sexuality in the service of reproduction to sexuality in the function of obtaining pleasure from zones of the body. With this restoration of the primary structure of sexuality, the primacy of the genital function is broken, as is the desexualization of the body which has accompanied this primacy. The organism in its entirety becomes the substratum of sexuality, while at the same time the instinct's objective is no longer absorbed by specialized function, namely that of bringing one's own genitals into contact with those of someone of the opposite sex. Thus enlarged, the field and objective of the instinct becomes the life of the organism itself. This process, almost naturally by its inner logic, suggests the conceptual transformation of sexuality into eros. The introduction of the term eros in Freud's later writings was certainly motivated by different reasons. Eros, as life instinct, denotes a larger biological instinct rather than a larger scope of, se of sexuality. However, it may not be accidental that Freud does not rigidly distinguish between eros and sexuality, and his usage of the term eros, especially in the ego and the id, civilization and its discontents, and in an outline of psychoanalysis implies an enlargement of the meaning of sexuality itself. Even without Freud's explicit reference to Plato, the change in emphasis is clear. Eros signifies a quantitative and qualitative ag aggrandizement of sexuality, and the aggrandized concept seems to demand a correspondingly modified concept of sublimation. The modifications of sexuality are not the same as the modifications of Eros. Freud's concept of sublimation refers to the fate of sexuality under a repressive reality principle. Thus, sublimation means a change in the aim and object of the instinct with regard to which our social values come into the picture. The term is applied to a group of unconscious processes which have in common that, as the result of inner or outer deprivation, the aim of object libido undergoes a more or less complete deflection, modification, or inhibition. In the great majority of instances, the new aim is one distinct or remote from sexual satisfaction, i.e. is an asexual or non-sexual aim. This mode of sublimation is to a high degree dictated by specific societal requirements. It cannot be automatically extended to other and less repressive forms of civilization with different social values. Under the performance principle, the diversion of libido into useful cultural activities takes place after the period of early childhood. Sublimation then operates on a preconditioned instinctual structure, which includes the functional and temporal restraints of sexuality, its channeling into monogamic reproduction, and the desexualization of most of the body. Sublimation works with the thus preconditioned libido and its possessive, exploitative, aggressive force. The repressive modification of the pleasure principle precedes the actual sublimation, and the latter carries the repressive elements over into the socially useful activities. However, there are other modes of sublimation. Freud speaks of aim-inhibited sexual impulses which need not be described as sublimated, although they are closely related to sublimated impulses. They have not abandoned their directly sexual aims, but they are held back by internal resistances from attaining them. They rest content with certain approximations to satisfaction. Freud calls them social instincts and mentions as examples the affectionate relations between parents and children, feelings of friendship, and the emotional ties in marriage which had their origin in sexual attraction. 
Moreover, in group psychology and analysis of the ego, Freud has emphasized the extent to which societal relations, community and civilization are founded on unsublimated as well as sublimated libidinous ties, sexual love for women, as well as desexualized sublimated homosexual love for other men, here appear as instinctual sources of an enduring and expanding culture. This conception suggests, in Freud's own work, an idea of civilization very different from that derived from repressive sublimation, namely civilization evolving from and sustained by free libidinal relations. Geza Rohim used Ferenzi's notion of a genitofugal libido to support his theory of the libidinous origin of culture. With the relief of extreme tension, libido flows back from the object to the body, and this recathecting of the whole organism with libido results in a feeling of happiness in which the organs find the reward for work and stimulation to further activity. The concept assumes a genitofugal libido ten trend to the development of culture. In other words, an inherent trend in the libido itself toward cultural expression without external repressive modification. And this cultural trend in the libido seems to be genitofugal, that is to say, away from genital supremacy toward the erotiz erotization of the entire organism. These concepts come close to recognizing the possibility of non-repressive sublimation. The rest is left to speculation. And indeed, under the established reality principle, non-repressive sublimation can appear only in marginal and incomplete aspects. Its fully developed form would be sublimation without desexualization. The instinct is not deflected from its aim. It is gratified in activities and relations that are not sexual in the sense of organized genital sexuality, and yet are libidinal and erotic. Where repressive sublimation prevails and determines the culture, non-repressive sublimation must manifest itself in contradiction to the entire sphere of social usefulness. Viewed from this sphere, it is the negation of all accepted productivity and performance. The Orphic and narcissistic images are recalled. Plato blames Orpheus for his softness. He was only a hard player. A harp player, sorry which was duly punished by the gods, as was Narcissus's refusal to participate. Before the reality as it is, they stand condemned. They rejected the required sublimation. However, um, sublimation is not always the negation of a desire. It does not always take the form of sublimation against the instincts. It could be sublimation for an ideal. Thus, Narcissus no longer says, I love myself such as I am. He says, I am such that I love myself. The Orphic and Narcissistic Eros engulfs and, or engulfs the reality in libidinal relations, which transform the individual and his environment. But this transformation is the isolated deed of unique individuals. And as such, it generates death even if sublimation does not proceed against the instincts, but as their affirmation. It must be super-individual process on common ground. As an isolated individual phenomenon, the reactivation of narcissistic libido is not culture-building, but neurotic. The difference between a neurosis and a sublimation is evidently the social aspect of the phenomenon. A neurosis isolates, a sublimation unites. In a sublimation, something new is created, a house or a community or a tool, and it is created in a group or for the use of a group. Libido can take the road of self-sublimation only as a social phenomenon, as an unrepressed force. It can promote the formation of culture only under conditions which relate associated individuals to each other in the cultivation of the environment for their developing needs and faculties. Reactivation of polymorphous and narcissistic sexuality 
ceases to be a threat to culture and can itself lead to culture building if the organism exists not as an instrument of alienated labor, but as a subject of self-realization. In other words, if socially useful work is at the same time the transparent, transparent satisfaction of an individual need. In primitive society, this organization of work may be immediate and natural. In mature civilization, it can be envisaged only as the result of liberation. Under such conditions, the impulse to obtain pleasure from the zones of the body may extend to seek its objective in lasting and expanding libidinal relations because this expansion increases and intensifies the instinct's gratification. Moreover, nothing in the nature of Eros justifies the notion that the extension of the impulse is confined to the corporal sphere. If the antagonistic separation of the physical form or the physical from the spiritual part of the organism is itself the historical result of repression, the overcoming of this antagonism would open the spiritual sphere to the impulse. The aesthetic idea of a sensuous reason suggests such a tendency. It is essentially different from sublimation insofar as the spiritual sphere becomes the direct object of Eros and remains a libidinal object. There is a change neither in energy nor in aim. The notion that Eros and Agape may, after all, be one and the same, not that Eros is Agape but that Agape is Eros, may sound strange after almost 2,000 years of theology. Nor does it seem justifiable to refer to Plato as a defender of this identification. Plato, who himself introduced the repressive definition of Eros into the household of Western culture. Still, the symposium contains the clearest celebration of the sexual origin and substance of the spiritual relations. According to Di Diotima, Eros drives the desire from one beautiful body to another and finally to all beautiful bodies. For the beauty of one body is akin to the beauty of another, and it would be foolish not to recognize that the beauty in every body is one and the same. Out of this truly polymorphous sexuality arises the desire for that which animates the desired body, the psyche and its various manifestations. There is an unbroken ascent in erotic fulfillment from the corporal love of one to, to that of the others to the love of beautiful work and play, and ultimately to the love of beautiful knowledge. The road to higher culture leads through the true love, leads through the true love of boys. Spiritual procreation is just as much the work of Eros as is corporal procreation and the right and true order of the polis is just as much an erotic one as is the right and true order of love. The culture-building power of Eros is non-repressive sublimation. Sexuality is neither deflected from nor blocked in its objective. Rather, in attaining its objective, it transcends it to others, searching for fuller gratification. In the light of the idea of non-repressive sublimation, Freud's definition of Eros as striving to form living substance into ever greater unities so that life may be prolonged and brought to higher development takes on added significance. The biological drive becomes a cultural drive. The pleasure principle reveals its own dialectic. The erotic aim of sustaining the entire body as subject object of pleasure calls for the continual refinement of the organism, the intensification of its receptivity, the growth of its sensuousness. The aim generates its own projects of realization. The abolition of toil, the amelioration of the environment, the conquest of disease and decay, the creation of luxury. All these activities flow directly from the pleasure principle, and at the same time they constitute work which associates individuals to greater unities. No longer confined within the mutilating dominion of the performance principle, they modify the impulse without deflecting it from its aim. There is sublimation and, consequently, culture but this sublimation proceeds in a system of expanding and enduring libidinal relations, which, which are in themselves work relations. The idea of an erotic tendency toward work is not foreign to psycho psychoanalysis. 
Freud himself remarked that work provides an opportunity for a very considerable discharge of libidinal component impulses, narcissistic, aggressive, and even erotic. We have questioned this statement because it makes no distinction between alienated and non-alienated labor, between labor and work. The former is, by its very nature, repressive of human potentialities and therefore also repressive of the libidinal component impulses, which may enter into work. But the statement assumes a different significance if it is seen in the context of the social psychology, which Freud proposes in Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. He suggests that the libido props itself upon the satisfaction of the great vital needs and chooses as its first objects the people who have a share in that process. This proposition, if unfolded in its implications, comes close to vitiating Freud's basic assumption that the struggle for existence, that is, for the satisfaction of the great vital needs, is per se anti-libidinous insofar as it necessitates the re regimentation of the instinct by a constraining reality principle. It must be noted that Freud links the, the libido not merely to the satisfaction of the great vital needs, but to the joint human efforts to obtain satisfaction, i.e. to the work process. Experience has shown that in cases of collaboration, libidinal ties are regularly formed between the fellow workers, which prolong and solidify the relations between them to a point beyond what is merely profitable. If this is true, then a knock is not a sufficient cause for the instinctual constraints of civilization and not a sufficient reason for denying the possibility of a non-repressive libidinous culture. Freud's suggestions in group psychology and the analysis of the ego do more than reformulate his thesis of Eros as the builder of culture. Culture here rather appears as the builder of Eros, that is to say, as the natural fulfillment of the innermost trend of Eros. Freud's psychology of civilization was based on the inexorable conflict between Anonk and free instinctual development. But if Anonk itself becomes the primary field of libidinal development, the contradiction evaporates. Not only would the struggle for existence not necessarily cancel the possibility of instinctual freedom, as we suggested in chapter 6, but it would even constitute a prop for instinctual gratification. The work relations which form the base of civilization and thus civilization itself would be propped by non-desexualized instinctual energy. The whole concept of sublimation is at stake. The problem of work, a socially useful activity without repressive sublimation, can now be restated. It emerged as the problem of a change in the character of work by virtue of which the latter would be assimilated to play, the free play of human faculties. What are the instinctual, what are the instinctual preconditions for such a transformation? The most far-reaching attempt to answer this question is made by Barbara Lantos in her article, Work in the Instincts. She defines work and play in terms of the instinctual stages involved in these activities. Play is entirely subject to the pleasure principle. Pleasure is in the movement itself, insofar as it activates erotogenic zones. The fundamental feature of play is that it is gratifying in itself, without serving any other purpose than that of instinctual gratification. The impulses that determine play are the progenital ones. Play expresses objectless autoeroticism and gratifies those component instincts which are always directed toward the objective world. Work, on the other hand, serves ends outside itself, namely the ends of self-preservation. To work is the active effort of the ego, to get from the outside world whatever is needed for self-preservation. This contrast establishes a parallelism between the organization of the instincts and that of human activity. Play is an aim in itself, Work is the agent of self-preservation, component instincts, and autoerotic activities. Seek pleasure with no ulter ulterior consequences. Genital activity is the agent of procreation. 
The genital organization of the sexual instincts has a parallel in the work organization of the ego instincts. Thus, it is the purpose and not the content which marks an activity as play or work. A transformation in the instinctual structure, such as that from the pregenital to the genital stage, would entail a change in the instinctual value of the human activity regardless of its content. For example, if work were accompanied by a reactivation of pregenital polymorphous eroticism, it would tend to become gratifying in itself without losing its work content. Now it is precisely such a reactivation, reactivation of polymorphous eroticism which appeared as the consequence of the conquest of scarcity and alienation. The altered societal conditions would therefore create an instinctual basis for the transformation of work into play. In Freud's terms, the less the efforts to obtain satisfaction are impeded and directed by the interest in domination, the more freely the libido could prop itself upon the satisfaction of the great vital needs. Sublimation and domination hang together, and the dissolution of the former would, with the transformation of the instinctual structure, also transform the basic attitude toward man and nature, which has been characteristic of Western civilization. In psychoanalytic literature, the development of libidinal work relations is usually attributed to a general maternal attitude as the dominant trend of a culture. Consequently, it is considered as a feature of primitive societies rather than as a possibility of mature civilization. Margaret Mead's interpretation of Arapesh culture is entirely focused on this attitude. To the Arapesh, the world is a garden that must be tilled, not for oneself, not in pride and boasting, not for hoarding and usury, but that the yams and the dogs and the pigs and most of all, the children may grow. From this whole attitude flow many of the other Arapesh traits, the lack of conflict between the old and young, the lack of any expectation of jealousy or envy, the emphasis upon cooperation. Foremost in this description appears the fundamentally different experience of the world. Nature is taken, not as an object of domination and exploitation, but as a garden which can grow while making human beings grow. It is the attitude that experiences man and nature is joined in a non-repressive and still functioning order. We have seen how the otherwise most divergent traditions of thought converged on this idea. The philosophical opposition against the performance principle. The Orphic and Narcissistic Archetypes, the Aesthetic Conception. But while the psychoanalytical and anthropological concepts of such an order have been oriented on the prehistorical and pre-civilized past, our discussion of the concept is oriented on the future, on the conditions of fully mature civilization. The transformation of sexuality into Eros and its extension to lasting libidinal work relations here presuppose the rational reorganization of huge industrial apparatus, a highly specialized societal division of labor, the use of fantastically destructive energies and the cooperation of vast masses. The idea of libidinal work relations in a developed industrial society finds little support in the tradition of thought, and where such support is forthcoming, it seems of a dangerous nature. <coughs> The transformation of labor into pleasure is the central idea in Fourier's giant socialist utopia. If industry is the fate assigned to us by the creator, how can one believe that he wishes to force us into it, that he does not know how to bring to bear some nobler means, some enticement capable of transforming work into pleasure? Fourier insists that this transformation requires a complete change in the, so in the social institutions distribution of the social product according to need, assignment of functions according to individual faculties and inclinations, constant mutation of functions, short work periods, and so on. But the possibility of attractive labor derives above all from the release of libidinal forces. Fourier assumes the existence of an attraction industrielle or attraction industrielle which makes for pleasurable cooperation. It is based on the attraction passionnée in the nature of man, which persists despite the opposition of reason, duty, prejudice. 
This attraction passionnée tends toward three principal objectives. The creation of luxury or the pleasure of the five senses, the formation of libidinal groups of friendship and love, and the establishment of a harmonious order, organizing these groups for work in accordance with the development of the individual passions, internal and external play of faculties. For Ye comes close or comes closer than any other utopian socialist to elucidating the dependence of freedom on non-repressive sublimation. However, in his detailed blueprint for the realization of this idea, he hands it over to a giant organization and administration and thus retains the repressive elements. The working communities of the Fonostar anticipate strength through joy rather than freedom, the beautification of mass culture rather than its abolition. <clears throat> Work as free play cannot be subject to administration. Only alienated labor can be organized and administered by rational routine. It is beyond the sphere, but on its basis that non-repressive sublimation creates its own cultural order. Once more, we emphasize that non-repressive sublimation is utterly incompatible with the institutions of the performance principle and applies the negation of this principle. This contradiction is the more important since post-Freudian psychoanalytic theory itself shows a marked tendency to obliterate it and to glorify repressive productivity as human self-realization. A striking example is provided by Eve Hendrick in his paper, Work and the Pleasure Principle. He suggests that the energy and the need to exercise the physiological organs available for work are not provided by the libido, but rather by a special instinct, the mastery instinct. Its aim is to control or alter a piece of the environment by the skillful use of perceptual, intellectual, and motor techniques. This drive for integration and skillful performance is mentally and emotionally experienced as the need to perform work efficiently. Since work is thus supposed to be itself the gratification of an instinct rather than the temporary negation of an instinct, work yields pleasure in efficient performance. Work pleasure results from the satisfaction of the mastery instinct, but work pleasure and libidinal pleasure usually coincide since the ego organizations which function as work are generally and perhaps always utilized concurrently for the discharge of surplus libidinal tension. As usual, the revision of Freudian theory means a retrogression. The assumption of any special instinct begs the question, but the assumption of a special mastery instinct does even more. It destroys the entire structure and dynamic of the mental apparatus which Freud has built. Moreover, it obliterates the most repressive features of the performance principle by interpreting, interpreting them as gratification of an instinctual need. Work, pure and simple, is the chief social manifestation of the reality principle. Insofar as work is conditional upon delay and diversion of instinctual gratification, and according to Freud it is, it contradicts the pleasure principle. If work, pleasure, and libidinal pleasure usually coincide, then the, then the very concept of the reality principle becomes meaningless and superfluous. And the vicissitudes of the instincts as described by Freud would at best be an abnormal development. Nor can the reality principle be saved by stipulating, as Hendrick does, a work principle different from the reality principle, for if the latter does not govern work, it has practically nothing to govern in the reality. To be sure, there is work that yields pleasure and skillful performance of the bodily organs available for work. Um, but what kind of work and what kind of pleasure? If pleasure is indeed in the act of working and not extraneous to it, such pleasure must be derived from the acting organs of the body and the body itself, activating the erotogenic zones or eroticizing the body as a whole. In other words, it must be libidinal pleasure. In a reality governed by the performance principle, such libidinal work is a rare exception and can occur only outside or at the margin of the work world as hobby, play, or in a directly erotic situation. The normal kind of work, socially useful occupational activity, 
in the prevailing division of labor is such that the individual in working does not satisfy his own impulses, needs, and faculties, but performs a pre-established function. Hendrick, however, takes no notice of the fact of alienated labor, which is the predominant mode of work under the given reality principle. Certainly there can be pleasure in alienated labor too. The typist who hands in a perfect transcript, the tailor who delivers a perfectly fitting suit, the beauty parlor attendant who fixes, who fixes, oh, I lost my spot. The perfect hairdo, the laborer who fulfills his quota, all may feel pleasure in a job well done. However, either this pleasure is extraneous, anticipation of reward, or it is the satisfaction, itself a token of repression, of being well occupied in the right place, of contributing one's part to the functioning of the apparatus. In either case, such pleasure has nothing to do with primary instinctual gratification. To link performances on assembly lines in offices and shops with instinctual needs is to glorify dehumanization as pleasure. It is no wonder that Hendrick considers as the sublime test of men's will to perform their work effectively, the efficient functioning of an army which has no longer any fantasies of victory in a pleasant future, which keeps on fighting for no other reason than because it is the soldier's job to fight, and to do the job was the only motivation that was still meaningful. To say that the job must be done because it is a job is truly the apex of alienation. The total loss of instinctual and intellectual freedom, repression which has become not the second, but the first nature of man. In contrast to such aberrations, the true spirit of psychoanalytic theory lives in the uncompromising effort to reveal the anti-humanistic forces behind the philosophy of productiveness. Of all things, hard work has become a virtue instead of the curse it was always advertised to be by our remote ancestors. Our children should be prepared to bring their children up so they won't have to work as a neurotic necessity. The necessity to work is a neurotic symptom. It is a crutch. It is an attempt to make oneself feel valuable, even though there is no particular need for one's working.